want to in the chat uh, you can see the chat message pop up you can uh, post a message on the chat or you can unmute and speak whichever is convenient for you so don't hesitate at all anytime you have a question or a comment uh, so let's talk about what we're going to do here today i want to talk about uh, applying functional programming um, different people i'm sure each one of us have a journey through programming over the years uh, just a quick uh, you know show of hands you can you know, raise your thumb on your uh you know uh, um, interface over there or you can just post it on the chat whichever is fine uh, you know how many of us have experience with uh, and started programming in languages predominantly supported uh, imperative style of programming uh, well what's your take on that how much of, how much experience do you have in imperative compared to functional style of programming which one have you done mostly in your experience you have 10 years of imperative says manish uh, what else? Uh, uh, F sharp and Elixir is awesome. That's great. And uh, you have two years in Scala, but focus on imperative versus functional. Uh, how much have you spent on imperative versus functional style? You could use any of these languages and still program imperatively in those as well, almost. So uh, Kedar says imperative and imperative and do and functional. Interesting, equal and equal. Uh, you know, uh, again, don't focus on languages here, right? The question is imperative versus functional need to listen. So which, of, which way are we focusing mostly, imperative or functional style? Mixing both and fibers of imperative style. A little slow in getting the responses here, but that's fine. So, so essentially, a lot of us have done programming in imperative style. That's the industry wide. Uh, I spent decades programming in imperative style of programming before I got into functional style of programming. And what actually made it even worse is people would tell me that it's really easy to program in functional style of, you know, functional style. No, it's not because it's a paradigm shift. And in general though, it's not that hard to learn a language. It's not that hard to learn a library or an API. What's really hard for a lot of us is paradigm shifts because paradigm shifts require rethinking about how we do things. Paradigm shift requires change in the line of thinking, change in the approaches we take, and, and it requires, uh, generally speaking, a lot of effort. And in my life, I would say, give or take, I've gone through about six paradigm shifts, I think. And, and I remember kicking and screaming through every single one of those paradigm shifts because you just don't wake up one morning and say this is natural i can write code in this it takes sometimes months on end before we get really comfortable writing code in a different you know paradigm different style of programming my very first paradigm shift was programming itself i remember those days way back in time when i was a student and i started getting excited about writing algorithms and programming and that was a huge paradigm shift to believe that actually you can make machines do things. That was my very first paradigm shift. My second paradigm shift was in object oriented programming. This was the time when object oriented programming was relatively new and people were still, you know, thinking about should we really program in objects or should we not? And we were just exploring things and, and really learning to program in objects was a paradigm shift. My next paradigm shift, which was probably even more difficult, was in distributed computing. Uh, this is one thing I really hope my children will never find out that their dad once programmed with COM and CORBA. So programming in COM and CORBA, and I remember waking up in the morning with the huge fog around my head because I don't have a clue how these things work. And the next time somebody says object factory, I'll strangle them. And it was like, how does these things actually work? And I really, it was not about writing code, but learning how these things behave. You know, how do you really get an object or access to an object which runs on a remote system? That was a huge paradigm shift to getting really my heads around object, uh, uh, distributed object computing and common core technologies. That was my third paradigm shift. The next one after that, I would say was really hard, was to think about asynchronous programming. When it came to really writing code on Node and trying to understand how applications can be written using Node, 
and how they behave asynchronously compared to maybe how they behave using parallel or you know execution in terms of multi-threading that was a paradigm shift as well and then of course the next paradigm shift was functional programming for me and trying to understand how to think functionally rather than imperatively was a huge paradigm shift and a more recent one was reactive programming and, and again, what the frustration around that was, you know, a lot of people talk about reactive programming, but what does it really mean to program reactively? And, and try to really wrap the head around and think about the fundamentals of writing code and why we would do that, that was a paradigm shift as well. So over the years, I've gone through these kinds of paradigm shifts and every one of them were a lot more bumpier in terms of getting really heads, you know, my head wrapped around it. And, and I definitely would say uh, it's a journey that's worth the taking if we understand the reasons to do and how we can, we can benefit from it. So what I want to talk about in this presentation is we'll talk about functional programming. We'll talk about you know, why we should use functional programming. We'll talk about when we should use functional programming and maybe when we shouldn't use functional programming. You know, are there times when it's a right solution versus not a right solution? And then I'll wrap up with the how to. You know, how do we really make use of this? Practically speaking, in applications we develop, what are some of the things we need to really consider? But before we even dive into it, one of the things I would emphasize is I'm not a fan of being biased and saying there is one way to do things. It's, it's really important to embrace that there are different ways to do this. And, and keep in mind that these are tools towards a solution. That's what they really are. And which tool do we use depends on the nature of the problem we are trying to solve. Imagine somebody knocks on your door and walks in with a hammer and says, I am here to fix your plumbing. And you look at this person and say, well, thanks for coming, but what, what are your tools? And the person takes a whack at the hammer and says, I don't need any stinking tools. I've got a hammer and that's all I need. A very dangerous person to let in, isn't it? Well, we want people to use the right tools for the right job. And the goal is not to have an overwhelming set of tools, but to ask the question, maybe a chisel is a better tool in this situation versus a screwdriver or a wrench, and you want to be able to switch between them as they make sense. So that's the question we want to ask, not be biased about and say there's one way to do this. So let's talk a little bit about the imperative style of programming. What does it really mean to be programming an imperative style? So let's think a little bit about the natures of programming we do. So imperative style is basically where we tell what to do and also how to do it. So essentially, you are spelling out every single detail of what you're trying to do and how you are going to actually do this as well. Let's take a little example and play with it just to get a feel for it. So let's say we have some names on our hand. And in this case, I'll say list of, let's say, or we'll say some names over here that I want to work with. And, and given this names, as you may recognize characters from the uh, Finding Nemo, and we want to know, is Nemo there? So how do we go about finding if Nemo exists in this particular collection? Well, I'm sure every one of us have written code for this and, and can you know, write it in a blank. So we could say, for example, Boolean, you could say found is equal to false to begin with. And then you could say a far int i equal to zero, and then i is less than, oh, wait a minute, is it less than or less than or equal to? We are never sure about it, isn't it? So every time you write the less than, you pause and ask the question, is it less than or less than or equal to? I often say that symbol is the international symbol for confusion. Because every time you write it, you got to pause and ask the question whether it is less than or less than or equal to. Then, of course, is it I plus plus or plus plus I? Well, if you really think about this, this is, you know, do if you could say many moving parts in it and also complexity that you are dealing with. Now, somebody might tell you, wait a minute, that's a simple for loop. 
This is one thing we need to be very careful. The words that we use, we often, uh, uh, oftentimes, we often um, confuse the word, so con uh, confuse the word simple, uh, on the other hand, with the word, uh, if you will, familiar. So we need to really ask the question, is it familiar or is it simple? When I talk to people, they would say, oh, that's complex. And I would say, hang on a second, are you saying it's complex or are you saying it's unfamiliar? Because a lot of times we generally as humans, this is in our DNA, we fear things that are, you know, weird or unfamiliar to us and we attach threats and complexities to those things. So we need to really ask the question, is it simple or is it familiar? So we could say in this particular example, the above is familiar but not simple. It's got way too many moving parts in it. Well, we could say far, for example, name coming from names, and we could argue, oh, that's actually much simpler than what we'd have written with the traditional for loop. So we can look at two things and we can say which one is difficult, more complex, and which one is simpler, relatively speaking. Then we can say here something along the lines of, we can say, if name is equal to, maybe in this case, Nemo, we could then say, all right, now we can say found is equal to true and set those uh, flags in there. But as an observant uh, you know, reader, you probably say, oh, but wait a minute, you better put a break. Otherwise, either you're going to do more work than necessary or depending on the problem you're solving, you might even get the wrong result, if you will. So again, you could say that's and how, and that's and how as well, as much as that's a how also that you have to focus on. And then of course, in the end of this, you could say simply if found is true, we could then say in this particular case, maybe output right there, well, we could say, oh, we found Nemo after all. So let's go ahead and say output, maybe Nemo, let's say found. And if it is not found, maybe play a really sad music and say Nemo, maybe not found. So when you write code like this, you can write the code to execute the logic but that was a lot of effort we had to put in. That's the imperative style of programming. So this is the most familiar style of programming, but what are some of the problems? So often involves, uh, if you will, uh, explicit uh, mutability. So explicit uh, mutability. So what is the wrong with explicit mutability? So the more mutability that you have, uh, you are going to be uh, spending more time trying to reason the code and that takes a lot of effort if you if you will and so it really becomes hard to reason but also hard to parallelize the code so if somebody tells you let's make the code parallel the only right response is to begin to laugh because the options are to laugh or cry. And it's not easy to parallelize imperative style code. It takes a lot of effort in general. So that's one problem you're gonna deal with in general when it comes to imperative style code. Also often uses what you can, what you can call as garbage uh, variables. So what is a garbage variable? A garbage variable is a variable needed from the solution, not the one needed from the problem itself. So the problem doesn't care about these variables, but we start introducing them because we need to comprehend the complexity of the solution. We keep introducing these variables. And, and finally, you could say, you know, has more uh, accidental uh, complexity. So usually accidental complexity, what is the difference in this particular case? An in, implicit complexity or inherent complexity is a complexity that comes from the problem that you are dealing with. On the other hand, accidental complexity comes from the solution that you're trying to use. And these complexities, unfortunately, exist not because of the domain, 
It is because of the solution we choose to. So oftentimes I would say, uh, may take less effort uh, to write uh, because we are familiar uh, oftentimes, but takes a lot more effort to read, understand uh, in general and change. So this is easier to write at the first time but becomes expensive over time progressively you're going to be spending more effort really taking the time to maintain it so that brings us to talking about the declarative style of programming what is declarative style compared to the imperative style well you can say declarative style of programming is where you could say we tell what to do uh, and specifically not how to do it. So essentially, your focus is on the big picture. What do you want to do, not on how to actually accomplish it. So you say, wait a minute, but what about the how? Who's going to take care of that? We delegate that to underlying libraries of code. So you delegate it to the APIs below and say, you take care of the details. I'll tell you what to do. That's declarative style. If you go back to this code for just a minute, we did all this effort right here, but notice what I'm going to do. I'm going to just comment out that entire section right there. So let's comment out that entire section. And, and now let's simply say, take these last four lines of code right in there for a second. And we don't have a found right now, but that's okay. We don't need a found, but instead what we can do is to simply say over here, names.contains Nemo. Let's go ahead and say Nemo. And, and if it contains it, tell me it's found. Otherwise, tell me it is not found. So what we just did is we went back to the given problem and we removed all those lines of code. Those are gone. And instead, we directly said, if the name contains Nemo, tell me that it's found. Otherwise, tell me it's not found. So you focus on what to do, not on how to do it. But it's a reasonable thought to have. So don't try to look up the code. Don't try to read the documentation. Don't try to use your ID to jump into the function. I want your gut feeling when I ask you this question. Uh, can we tell how the contains method is implemented. What is your gut answer to that question? What, com what comes to your mind? Don't, don't worry about being right or wrong. A for loop and iteration says Manish, uh, Suryada says it's a for loop. What is anybody else thinking? What is your thought? How do you think the contains method is it a super duper algorithm? Maybe it's using multiple threads. Maybe it's using a hash code. Maybe it's doing something else. Maybe it's using a set, says, you know, Yogesh. Maybe Rohit says it's a for loop as well. Good thought. And maybe it's a similar logic to what was written in imperative. But ah, beautiful thoughts right there. And Kedar nailed it. And he says, I don't care. Well, how rude of you to say you don't care, Kedar. Well, let's rephrase it in a polite way. Let's say it's encapsulated. Well, what does the word it, in, it's encapsulated mean? It's a polite way to say, I don't care. And that's a beautiful thought we really need to bring in, right? We don't care about how it's implemented. And, and Daniel says, we don't know how it's implemented. None of our business, bingo, right? It's none of my business. I don't care about it. So here, but let's be honest about it, right? As programmers, we may need to know for various reasons. Hey, what's the memory usage? What about security? What about, what about, what about? But here's the difference. The difference is really coming down to none of our business. Let's take that a little bit further. So in imperative, 
uh, style, you can say an imperative style. Uh, I apologize, my uh, hands have not warmed up yet. It's pretty darn cold here. So uh, it takes a while before I can start typing. So just bear with me a little bit. So, so imperative style basically is in imperative style, the details are on your uh, face. Whether you like it or not, it is absolutely on your face. This is, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's like that old uncle you avoid in family gatherings. You come out of the door and you see that uncle walk your way. You're like, oh no, the last time I said hello, five hours, my life was wasted. I'm not going to do this again today. That is imperative style. It, it is everything is on your face. That's what it really is. But on the other hand, in declarative uh, style, the details are one level below for you to seek. So think of slap. And that's the very first thing you want to think about when it comes to imperative versus function, a, a declarative style of programming. So what is slap? Slap stands for single level of abstraction uh, principle. So essentially, you are talking about a single level of abstraction principle. Now, look at the code we wrote, the imperative style code. Every detail is in front, in front of us. What does the declarative style code say? Tug it away. You are saying, does the collection contain the name? Hey, how do you know it contains? That's none of my business, like Daniel said. As Kedar said, I don't care. That's a different level of abstraction. Go there to find out how it is done. I don't care about it at my level of detail. So this raises the level of abstraction. So you, you are, and, and as, as Manish says, are you abstracting everything? No, you are raising the level of abstraction. That's the key. So you're asking the question, what do I need to focus here and what do I not need to focus? So the de declarative style is really an uh, application of the single level of abstraction principle, and your code focuses on that level. Now, you might wonder, why in the world talk about declarative style when we are here to talk about functional style of programming? And the answer to that question comes in by asking the question, what's a relationship? So first of all, before we go into it, let's talk about higher order functions. So what are higher order functions? When it comes to functions, we may pass objects to functions. So this is what we typically do. We pass objects to functions. We may, uh, in general, create objects uh, in functions. We may also, you could say, return objects uh, from functions as well. So when it comes to functions, generally, you pass objects, you may create objects, or you may return objects from functions. If we are sitting around a dinner table and we're having a good time talking, I might lean over to you and say, I really like to make my food spicy. Can you please pass that pepper shaker to me? And you may reach over the pepper shaker and give me the pepper shaker for me to put some pepper on my food. You passed an object to me, which is the pepper shaker. But on the other hand, as we continue conversation, you talk about maybe some food you really make and you like it. And I'm very curious, I say, hey, would you mind sharing the recipe with me? And you may take a piece of paper, scribble on that a recipe, and here you say, here you go, and enjoy the meal when you cook it. What did you give me? You gave me a bunch of instructions. So in other words, think of code as data. So essentially you are saying, uh, and, or you can say, uh, uh, you know, code is being passed around like data is being passed around. So uh, much of the recipe that you provide me. So this brings us to what are called higher order uh, functions. So what are really higher uh, order uh, functions? In the case of higher order functions, we may pass functions to functions. We may create functions and functions. 
and we may return functions from functions as well. So this leads to what's called a functional decomposition. So in other words, rather than building your code only with objects comprised of objects, you can build functions that are comprised of other functions. We go through a functional decomposition. So in other words, we can pass a function or receive a function back from other functions. So in that regard, we are dealing with what's called a higher order function. Now, what does this really take us when it comes to higher order functions? Well, the answer to that question really is the relationship. So think about declarative uh, style, for example, again. So when you think about a declarative style, you can, let's think of an example of declarative style. Uh, if I say that if you think of CSS cascading style sheet, if you think of a cascading style sheet, what do you say in a CSS? You specify here is a class or here is an ID or, or here is a X path and I want to represent this kind of style for anything that corresponds to it. So in, X, in, in CSS, you're not writing code that does the action. Instead, you're providing this transformation. You're saying, if this is the ID, I want this style to be applied. If this is the class, I want this style to be applied. Similarly, you can think about XSLT, where you are specifying the transformation you want to perform in your XML document. These are examples of, you know, declarative style, but the point you want to keep in mind is uh, declarative style, not all. So, but on the other hand, we'll come to that in a minute. What about the functional style then? Functional style is equal to declarative style plus the use, if you will. So declarative style plus the use of higher order uh, functions. So essentially, you are mixing the two together when it comes to functional style of programming. So you have declarative plus the use of higher order functions. So what is important to keep in mind is you can say, you know, all functional style code in general, uh, you, know, uh, you know, is declarative uh, in, in its style, but not all declarative is functional. So this is one of the biggest distinctions between the two. So anytime you write functional style code, you're also writing declarative style code. But CSS is not really functional. XSLT is not functional. But when you write functional style code, you're writing declarative style code. That is the biggest difference in here. So let's think about what does that mean in order for us to make this functional in general. So if I were to take a collection of data, for example, let's say we have a list of numbers I want to start with. Let's say numbers is equal to a list of, oh, let's say list of numbers 1 to 10. I want to start with that particular list. What I want to do here is I want to maybe print out only the double of all the even numbers in this collection. So how would I do that? I could say numbers.stream, which is an internal iterator. Oh, so Manish says, do we need to have both imperative uh, and HOFs for effective uh, 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 immutability? And we'll come to that in a few minutes. Uh, we'll come to that in a few minutes and see why that becomes necessary. Really good question, Manish, but we'll come to that and ask the question why, why that is. The why is an important question to answer, right? So we'll come to that in a few minutes. Good question. So, so numbers.stream, and I want to do a filter here, and I say, given a number you're going to provide for me, I want to simply say the number mod 2 is equal to 0, that becomes an even number. I could do a map operation. I could say given a number in, in, in this case. So we could say given a number, what do I want to do? So given this number, I want to say, let's go ahead and double the number. So number times two. And then finally, we could do a for each and say system.out. And I want to really print it right in there. 
So when I run the code, you are noticing that the double of all the even numbers are printed. So in this particular case, what are we uh, doing? We are calling a filter function. This is a higher order function. Similarly, this is a higher order function because you are passing a function to a function. That's what you are doing uh, in here. So essentially, the idea behind this is you are your filter is a higher order function and map is a higher order function. And you're passing to this the lambda expressions that you have in here that you are sending. So, so that becomes a functional style of code. Then the question is, why should we really program in functional style? The reason we want to program in functional style is you could say that in general, there are some really good benefits to programming in functional style. The first one is we have reduced, uh, reduced accidental complexity. So in general, you can say the code reads like the problem uh, statement. So this is one of the biggest benefits you're gonna get. You know, I was visiting a team in uh, near Seattle and they've been programming in functional style for a while. And one of the developers said, hey, I've got a code I wanna show to you. Can you take a look at it and tell me if I'm in the right approach? And generally speaking, when I walk into a random company, which I have never been to, and look at a code in a domain I've never looked at, my usual response is, where's the nearest exit? I want to run because the code is often too complex and hard to understand. And he shows me the code, and I'm literally reading through the code, and they're receiving you know, a, 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 these containers, and they have to go through processing of tax tariffs. And I'm just walking through the code. If the container is received, if it is from this origin, if it is this destination, if it is, it's a filter, 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 and a map, a series of map. And I'm like, well, I understand what the code is doing because the code is reading like the problem statement. That's one of the biggest benefits you get is that it becomes really easy to understand. It becomes less complex, less accidental complexity. So the second benefit is a uh, fewer, in general, you could say fewer uh, garbage uh, variables. So essentially, you have a lot fewer garbage variables that you normally you know, use in your code. If you look at this code example here, what is it that we have here that can be removed? Not a whole lot. Secondly, easier to reason, but also, you know, does not uh, you can say have uh, explicit mutability. I keep using the word explicit mutability. And the reason is there might be mutability in the different levels below, but I don't care about it. I am not dealing with the mutability directly in my code. And often easier to parallelize as well. That's another huge benefit you get out of this particular approach is the code is easier to parallelize when you want to. So, so why should we choose writing code in functional style? Reduced complexity. So, but on the other hand, I think it's important for us to keep in mind. So we may say in general, this might be an observation. You know, most of us, me included, have a lot of experience in imperative style of programming. If you wake me up in the middle of the night and tell me to solve a problem, my mind is gonna think imperatively because that's what I've done most of the time. So you could say imperative style, you know, uh, in general, you could say due to familiarity, you could say is easier to write but harder to read. On the other hand, you could say functional style. You could again say due to unfamiliarity, again, is harder to write but easier to read because the code begins to read like a problem statement. But keep in mind, code is written once but read and changed many, many times. So essentially, you want to optimize for rewrite and improvement 
you don't want to optimize it for the initial right in general so so that is one of the things to keep in mind uh, manish says also immutable doesn't uh, does away with the need for synchronization in a multi-thread programming and a lot more as well it avoids race conditions it avoids errors that come from improper synchronization I often call it as the synchronize and suffer model. You don't synchronize and smile. You synchronize and suffer after that because did I get this right? Did I make a mistake, right? It's very error prone and, and really hard to get it right. So it's not just you remove the need for synchronization. You remove a slew of errors that come after that as well. That becomes extremely important. So, so we talked about why we want to consider writing functional style of programming. It really comes down to reduced complexity and easier to reason, easier to parallelize when you need to. I'll give you an example of this. I, uh, not too long ago, worked on a big data project and they had, once I, once I went to the client side, I found out they had 53 billion computations that they need to perform to solve a problem. You can imagine, right, 53 billion computations. And I was sitting down with their architect and we were talking about how to really make things better. Their system would take literally 12 hours to execute. Now, what that means is if you're a data scientist, you came to work, you created a change to a data model and you say, hey, we want to run this data model. And you tell your data scientist, thanks, now you can go home, we will run this, and when you come back tomorrow, you can see the results. That's just unfortunate, isn't it? Because 12 hours of execution means you get one opportunity to do, see your result on a day's work. And they when, they, when they hired me, they said, we want to bring this down to two to three hours in time. So a data scientist can tweak their model and see the result at least two or three times a day at least. Can we do that? So we were brainstorming this and trying to implement in functional style with their architect. And, and about a week or so later, the architect looked at me and said, hey, I was not the original person who created this code. There was another architect before my time and I remember spending a lot of time talking to that architect and every now and then that architect would keep complaining, I really wish Java had functional programming. And he said, now today, I finally understand why he kept saying, I really wish that architect was here to see how this code is now different and behaves with the functional style of code. That's one of the reasons we want to do. We were paralyzing this code after re-implementing in functional style and we were getting really good performance through the system. That's one of the reasons to really do this. So, so given this, let's talk a little bit about two very important features when it comes to functional programming and why those two features are extremely important to consider. The first one is functional composition. So what is functional composition? When it comes to functional composition, it is the ability of composing functions using other functions. Now, when you go here, look at this code right there. What's happening here is you are seeing a filter and you are seeing a map. But what's happening internally is it uses what's called a fusion. It takes the two functions and composes them together. But to get a better understanding of this, let's think about this a little bit differently when it comes to a functional style of programming. So let's say I have a, 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 a public, let's say static, and I'm showing the examples here in Java, but you could do this in almost any language that supports the functional style of programming. So you can say public static, let's say in this case, uh, avoid a print, and the print function takes a number as a first argument. It takes a message, let's say, as a second argument. And then finally, we send a function which takes an integer and returns an integer. We'll call it as a func right now and see how we're going to use this. 
So in here, if you will, let's go ahead and bring in the java.util.function.function. Now I want to simply print out the given number plus let's say the message that we have plus let's say we want to print out the function.apply and we'll pass the given number to it right there. So when you look at this particular code, you are simply printing out the evaluation of that function. So what if I said function integer comma integer, we'll call it as inc is equal to given a, let's say a, a, a number, I want to simply return, let's say a number a plus one. That's all I want to return from this particular call. So in here, if I were to print, uh, return this, you know, incremented value of the number, you can say a print five and you could say incremented and you want to pass to it the inc function like so. And it says five incremented is six, not a big deal. Similarly, you could say a, a seven and seven incremented is a eight, so not a problem at all. But what if we were to uh, you know, create yet another function. We will call it as, let's say, double it. So a double it function is going to take the given number and double it like so. But how do I call that particular function? I can definitely pass. We could say in this case, a five doubled is going to be, we call the double it function. And likewise, we can take a seven and we can double it as well. So far, so good, right? But what if I want to call the print, pass a five and say incremented and doubled. So I want to say incremented and doubled. And in this case, what do I pass to this particular function? Well, I don't want to write the new function right now because we already have those functions. What can we do? Well, here's what you cannot do. You cannot pass increment and also pass the double it like so, right? So that's not going to be permitted to this particular call. So you cannot say, I want to pass those two functions. Why? Because the print function says, give me one function. You can take this function, you can give to the function, that's perfectly fine. Or you can take this orange function, give it to it as well. But what you cannot do is to take the print function and say, here you go, take the two functions. It's not going to accept it. So what could we potentially do in here? This is where functional composition really comes in. So notice now what you can do here is to say, hey, we have an input coming into increment that does the increment and returns a response. Similarly, we have a double it function, which is going to do the work right there for doubling the value. So here is the double it function. But what if we can now say we want to create a increment and double, uh, a, a double, right? What does this function look like? You want to take the data and you want to pass it to this particular function which at the very broad level is going to increment and double it. So, but this function that you see at the outset, what do you want this function to do? Internally, it is going to first of all, take the data given and pass it to the increment function and take the output of increment and pass it down to the doubled, uh, double it function and take the output of the double it function and return it as its own output. So in a sense, what you're saying is, here is one function and here is another function, but I want to compose those functions together. So you take the output of one function, connect it as an input of another function. So now you can go to the print function, you can give it one function if you want to, or you can give the composed function. And the composed function becomes this aggregator or composed function, which says, I'll take the input, pass to the first function, take the output, pass to the second function, take the output of that and give it to you. So you can either work with functions separately 
or you can work with them as a composite. Now, here is a way to think about it. If I were to ask you, what is this? You're going to say, that's a pen. Well, sure, that's a pen. We all, you know, abstract things out as humans. Yeah, that's a pen. I can use the pen. But what if I were to say this as a slightly different way and I remove this little, you know, top part from here for a second. Now I say, did you notice there's a spring here? No, not your framework, the actual metal spring, right? So you have a spring in this. You got a little metal part. Oh, look, there's a casing that contains the ink. And you can say, now we got a bunch of pieces on our hand. You could even go to the next level and say, oh my gosh, there's going to be literally billions of atoms and molecules and electrons and protons. Or you can say, oh, Venkat, you just have a, you know, pen, right? That's all you have. So the idea really is you just have a pen that is abstracted from all these several things that have come together. Or similarly, you can say that's a function, but what does that function have? That function has these bits of pieces that are put together to form this entire hierarchy. So basically, you're pulling them together. Essentially, that's the idea. So in other words, what you can do here is to say ink, and you can say and then, and here you can say, I want to bring two things together. So this is going to be ink a dot and then, and what are we going to combine this with? Double X is the function you're going to combine that with. So when you run the code, five increment and doubled becomes a value of 12. So essentially the idea behind this is you are composing them into one function. That's called the and then function. So that's your functional composition. So to be able to compose these becomes extremely important. But be very careful looking at these kinds of solutions. Let's think a little bit more about this, if you will. Now, if you think about this functional composition, I want to draw the distinction here, if you will. So I'm going to say functional style is where we can use functional pipeline. So you are thinking about a functional pipeline. Let's enter in this thought just a little bit more to think about this idea of functional pipeline. So let's go over to just to experiment with this with a little example. And, and JavaScript, if, if you will, is a language that's had this ability to program from day one. So think about a lot of things we do in our lives. So if I say I have a source of data and I pass that source of data through a grep command where I look for some word, then I send it to a set command where I want to perform a transformation on some data. Then I want to pass it through a maybe a WC minus L as a you know, final step. Here's a question for you. Think about it in terms of functional programming. You know what a source of data is. What do you think grep is in functional programming terms? What do you think that operation is? Uh, bingo, right? Daniel uh, and, and uh, Loknathan says, hey, that's a grep function is a filter operation. That's exactly what it is. What do you think is the set function like? What is that doing? Bingo, right? Uh, he can say is, it's a map operation. That's what it really is. Absolutely. What do you think is WC minus L, which is going to tell you uh, count? Yeah, but count is more specialized. Bingo, right? And Hickam says that's really a reduce function. Count is a specialized reduce. That's what it really is. But it's a reduce operation. But now your Unix has been doing this transformation of data from day one. And that's a Unix-like programming. But similarly, you know, I am here right now in a, in a fairly cold uh, place and there's air and the air is going through a purifier and then 
it is going through a heater uh, over here and I'm getting the warmed up air, just not enough I think, but I'm getting that in this room. So that's a transformation of data. Or earlier, I took water and send it to a purifier, hopefully a different purifier than the above one. We could send it to a cooler and we can get some cool water to drink as well. You can think about this pipeline of operations. So one of the things you want to think about is, this is called the functional uh, pipeline, uh, pipeline pattern. So this is a way we want to think about where we transform the data. Now, if you really think about it, what does the heater really do? The heater heats up the air as it goes through. In your mind, you got to distinguish between separate the data from the pipeline. But what is this pipeline? Pipeline of, very important to keep in mind, functions. It's a pipeline of functions not pipeline of data. So you're dealing with the pipeline of functions that you are working with in general in this case. So in functional style, we work with in general a functional pipeline. But careful again, now let's think about this a little bit with respect to JavaScript. Now JavaScript is a great language, don't get me wrong, I love the language for various reasons, but if I say in here numbers is equal to, oh let's say one, two, three, four, five, and six, and I want to, let's say take this data that's given to us, but I want to apply a transformation on it. So I could say in here, output, we could say, for example, numbers dot, and we could uh, start with this collection of numbers dot, let's say, a filter, and you could say, given a number, I want to return a number, let's say, mod 2 is equal to 0. So we get a value transform, we do a map operation, and in this case, we could actually let's do it a little differently. So we could then say, here comes the map, and we could say, given a number, I want to return a number, let's say, times two. And finally, I could say reduce, and we could say total comma number. And in this case, we could say total plus the number that we have uh, available. We could save this into a result is equal to and we could eventually print out, in this particular case, the result value that we have. So you can see in this case, the output is 24, but this is a functional pipeline. Is this good? I like it, it's definitely good, but there is one problem we need to be aware of. And that is, if you go back to this code, and if you were to take this step right here, and I'm going to comment these out. And if I were to simply output right there a console log like so, and I'm going to end this right here. So if I run the code now, notice what you see here. It's a collection two, four, and six. Now, if I go back and introduce the map, what do you notice? It's a collection four, eight, and 12. So, and then if I use the reduce operation, what do you notice in the end? The value 24. So, what is the problem here? We went from one collection to the next and one more and then a value. Now, what is the consequence of this? The consequence of this is the more garbage we create, the more garbage, uh, garbage we collect. So this is not going to be great. Well, when for very small, uh, you know, data set, this is not a big deal. I want to emphasize that. Don't start screaming when you look at code like this. It's all about the measure, right? It's kind of like saying, I want to buy gold. And I say, wow, you want to buy gold, why? And you say, I want to have a chain in gold or a bracelet in gold. Oh yeah, it's going to cost a few hundred dollars. No problem, go buy it. But if you say, I want to buy a truck full of gold, now we are like, whoa, wait a minute. 
that can run into millions. Let's think about what you're trying to do. So if it's a small data, yeah, it's going to cost some money. No big deal. Don't sweat it. But on the other hand, for a very large, uh, uh, you know, data set, a data set, this may be a problem. Is it? I don't know, but it might be. But evaluate it. So this is functional composition. I like to draw the distinction. Functional style is where we use functional composition, a pipeline, and functional pipeline uses functional composition. But what is functional programming? So as you can see in here, this could be a problem if the data set is really, really big. So what are we going to do about it? Well, let's think about it a little bit and see what we can do. This is where we need to distinguish between a couple of different things. Let's think about list for a minute versus a stream in the case of Java. So what is a list and what's a stream? You can think of a list as a bucket of water, right? Or in this case, it's a bucket of data. So you're thinking about a bucket of data. Now imagine your public works department calls you and says, hey folks, we're gonna be in your neighborhood on Tuesday and there will be no water from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. when we do maintenance. What do you do as an adult when you hear about it? Well, that's a wrong question. As adults, we just complain. What would you do as a responsible adult? Well, you would probably grab a bucket and store water for those hours. That's what a list is. It's a storage of data. But a stream, on the other hand, is actually not a data. It's a pipeline uh, of functions. That's what it really is. So a stream is a pipeline of functions. But more important, you need to be aware of one more thing, and that is the stream does not evaluate the, you know, the functions provided one at a time, uh, you know, on each piece of data. No, that's not what it does. So what does it do then? It first, uh, on the first hand, it first fuses the functions, uh, the what are called intermediate operations into one function. Then only on demand, it, uh, only on demand, it calls the fused function on data as needed. So this is essentially the power of lazy evaluation. This leads us towards a question that Manish was asking earlier, right? So the question Manish was asking is, is it important to honor immutability? And uh, this is something we need to work towards, right? Is the requirement that we need to satisfy. He said, do we need to have both immutability and higher order functions? Well, if you are dealing with functional style, you don't care about immutability. What you care about is really the higher order functions. Higher order functions brings you declarative style, and that minimizes the burden for you in terms of accidental complexity. And you could just stay with that at that point and be done with it. So, uh, so essentially, you got to think about how you are dealing with the pipeline. But let's go a little further with this and see what we could be careful with, right? So this is a problem I see in a lot of situation where we have to be a bit careful about because if we're not careful, it could be a problem. So let's think about one more example here. Suppose you are dealing with a collection of data. So let's say we have a list of data. So let's say list integer. And in this case, let's say we call it numbers equal to. And so Kedar says, so does the JVM wrap it at compile time and pipeline is ready for use? Excellent, that's exactly right. 
So at compile time, this is going to form a stream. We'll see that in action right now, uh, Kedar, and see how that works. So we have a list of, let's say, one, one, two, three, four, five, and six are the values that you see here. Now, you saw what happened in JavaScript. When you saw that intermediate result, it was a collection. Remember that, right? Now, let's see what we're going to see here. Let's go back here and bring in a, a, a stream right there. Actually, I probably don't need it. We'll see in a minute. So I'm going to say a var, let's say stream one equal to numbers.stream. That's my first approach, right? The second thing I'm going to say uh, again, this is not natural to write the code like this, but I want to illustrate the problem. Stream one dot filter, and I'm going to say here, given a number, I want to say check on the number. We'll see what that is in a minute. Then I have a stream three here, and I say given a stream two, I want to then perform a map where I will say double it and double the number. Then finally, I'm going to say a bar result is equal to a stream three dot find the first and I'm getting the first value and eventually I want to print out the result that I got. So if I go back to this code and if I say a public, let's say in this case, a static and here is a boolean, this is going to be a check which takes a number as an argument. And what do I want to do with this number that I pass as an argument? I'm going to simply say in here, return number mod two is equal to zero. Likewise, I'm going to take these three lines of code and I'm going to say this is going to return a integer where I'm going to say a double it, right, is the value I'm going to return. And I'm going to double the value like so. So I'm going to return that particular value. So if you look at this particular code, it says optional four. But what if I were to come down here and say output from this particular you know, level of the code, I want to output the uh, stream one. I want to output, let's say, the stream uh, two that I want to see what's in here and a stream three. What you notice is those are all pipeline intermediate steps. Notice those were not collection, those were really streams. So not at compile time, but the pipeline is built at compile time. But before the stream is evaluated, the streams get combined. So at runtime, you are not running the stream. So if you go back to this code for a minute, and if you were to say here is the result, and if you bring that together right there as a stream dot filter, and if you bring that together here as a map operation, like so, and then you combine that into a find the first eventually, if you look at this code, uh, going back to your question, Kedar, what's happening here is you get a stream that is a fusing all these operations and that fused stream is built during runtime and then after it fuses them it says now let's run it now if you look at this particular code example notice the behavior of this code if i go here and say output let's say a check called far and i say number and similarly i say over here a uh, double it let's say double it called for number but when i run the code notice it calls check for one and two it called double it for two and you're done what did it not do it never touched any value after the two so this could be as long as you want it to be keep going it doesn't matter it did not bother about any value after three uh, after two in this particular example these values were never touched so what do we know from this discussion we know that lazy evaluation uh, uh, evaluation leads to efficiency so to answer your question manish 
What leads to efficiency? Lazy evaluation leads to efficiency. So let's dig a little bit deeper into this. You can say polymorphism. So you can say polymorphism is to object-oriented programming uh, as, uh, this is where the emphasis comes in, right? As lazy evaluation is to functional programming. So the emphasis here is the following. You can say functional programming is, is a functional pipeline or functional composition plus the use of lazy evaluation. So, so now you know how these things relate to each other. So the term I like to distinguish is functional style, we're using a functional pipeline. Functional programming is where we also have lazy evaluation. Having said that, let's now look at one consequence of doing this. I've seen this a lot, and I've written code like this as well, which is even more scary. And this is why it's important for us to distinguish between these. And tell me if you've seen a code like this, if you will. So let's say list of string, we'll say names is equal to, let's create list of, oh, let's create some names here to work with. So now that we have these names with us, I want to say, have you, have you seen code like this? Names dot stream dot filter given a name name dot length is is equal to let's say length is equal to uh let's say uh four and dot map given a name you want to return a name dot to uppercase right everything is going wonderful so far but then you see a for each you take the name and you say in this case a result dot add name and then you eventually print out the result over here so now what is result you could say a list of string that you want to start with right there and this is a result is equal to new array list which is empty so when you run the code Notice the output says Dory kill and Nemo in uppercase. You could even say it worked. Question, has anyone seen code like this one where you have a for each and you are taking a collection and you're adding the data to that collection? Anyone seen this? Anyone has done that even more, right? What's, what's your? Call. Have you seen seen that before? Yeah, yeah, right. No, as of now, you're lucky. Look and down. Be that way. Hide away from the real world. You don't have to see such a horrible thing. So I'll give you an example of this. I won't mention the name of the company here. I, I can't. But it's a very, very large mutual fund company. We all know its name. We have our monies in those, in those companies. Well, a developer in that company sent me an email saying, hey, this code worked fine until yesterday. Starting today, it's misbehaving. Can you help me with it? And I look at the code he sent me, and he's got a collection of hedge funds. And he walks to the collection of hedge funds, filters out a select set of funds, performs an operation on it, gets a result from it, filter map map, and takes that and puts it into a collection in the for each. The code worked fine until yesterday, but one change that morning broke the code. Anyone wants to guess what that one change that programmer made to the collection of hedge funds being processed? Any, any guess? So, even in JS example, there was a result variable that was modified, added. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll come to that. Bingo, you nailed it. Uh, the Syriada says, hey, went from a stream to a parallel stream. Bingo, right? John, John nails it too, and phase, absolutely. 
very observant. So what they did is they changed, this programmer changed the stream to a parallel stream. So what is wrong with doing so? So this was a stream and they changed it to a parallel stream and all hell broke loose. And he was very lucky. Why? Because I always say, if you're lucky, the code fails on your machine. If you're not lucky, it waits and wait until you go into production. So the problem in this code is not the problem. A uh, problem is not mutability. It is shared mutability. So this is what you need to worry about. It's not a problem of mutability. It's a problem of shared mutability. So in other words, what you do shouldn't be visible outside. That's the key. So this goes to the earlier question. Hey, in, C, uh, in, in JavaScript, did we mutate? No, we are interested in avoiding shared mutability, not mutability. Mutability is not your enemy. Shared mutability becomes a problem. So what is the, what is the answer here? So in, in the case of functional programming relies on lazy evaluation, right? So lazy evaluation for efficiency and makes it easier to parallelize the code. That's the first thing, keep in mind. Second, lazy evaluation uh, and parallel uh, you know, execution rely on uh, immutability. So it, it rely on immutability, right? So uh, then again, in this case, lack of shared mutability, that's the key, for correctness. So it's not about efficiency at this point, it's about correctness. So we say, do not mutate uh, in general, right? Uh, again, I wanna say shared, right? Do not mutate, not because it is fashionable. It is because the, that has impact on correctness. So this is the reason why lack of shared mutability is critical. Let me ask you a question here and see if you're able to think about it. I'm gonna write this code in Kotlin and put your best effort. Don't write this code and run. I want your impression when you look at the code, right? So don't go off writing this. So I'm gonna say a val numbers in this case, let's say numbers is equal to list of, let's say one, two, three, start with that. Then I say val result is equal to numbers, we'll start with that right here, so numbers. And in this case, given these numbers, what do I wanna do? I wanna simply say dot map, and given an element, element times factor. And I want to get the factor, and I wanna print out in the end the result. Hey, what is factor? Let's say a factor is equal to two. So when I run this code, the result of this call is a two, four, and a six, no doubt about it, right? Now, I'm gonna say a factor equal to zero. And, and again, don't run this code. What is the, what's the result? And I'll give you three options here. One option, zero, zero, zero. Second option, two, four, and six. Third option, I have no clue. What's your, don't, write the code just read it and tell me what do you think rohit says zero 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 anyone else option one zero 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 harsh Har harsh says zero 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 and oh mark uh, uh, merklos uh, says two four six kedar says anyone with the option three i have no clue this is one of my favorite interview questions by the way I will ask the question, if they answer option one or option two, 
they are fired already. They should ask me, are you out of your mind? The worst thing to do at work is do Java puzzlers because I want to write production code that's easier to maintain. And this is not even Java, by the way, it's Kotlin code. So most of us said zero, zero, zero. Some of us said two, four, six. No one had the courage to say, I have no clue, which would be the right answer. Because when you run the code, what's the result of this operation? Most of us were wrong. Bingo, exactly as Keith says, but that is cognitive load, isn't it? And who wants to do that? Especially if you're a polyglot programmer and you're gonna switch between Kotlin and JavaScript and Scala and Groovy and Python and Ruby and keep going. This is the code you wanna write. And to make things even worse, as Keith pointed out, if I go back and say in here, what if I add one more step, a dot as sequence and run the code? Now, what's the output of the code? A zero, zero, zero in this particular case, that's the result of this operation uh, as we run it as a sequence. So the question is, what do you wanna do when you run the code like this? So you can get a collection convert it as a sequence, if you will, and perform the map operation on it. I'm not sure why it says it's a sequence rather than giving you the result, but it, it, that should do a lazy evaluation. And you can see it, it's, it's a transformation sequence on which you can execute the code after that. And then you can perform the map operation on it and get the result out of it. So that's kind of scary, isn't it? Because it depends on whether it's a lazy evaluation or an eager evaluation. That's exactly right. So the result is gonna be depending on which, and some languages do one, some languages do the other, and guess what? Some do both. So correctness is the concern, not as much as efficiency at that point. So what are some of the do's and don'ts? Do's, yes, leverage functional programming. What about the don'ts? Don't do shared mutability. You have to write pure functions and that takes a lot more effort. So when should we do functional programming? When should we not? Couple of things to consider. So to reduce complexity, to create code that can run faster in parallel execution. You can say easier to maintain in general. So these are the reasons you may want to use it. But when should you not use functional programming? If the problem has a lot of side effects, if your code fundamentally has a lot of side effects, if you constantly have to do database fetch, do some computation, put it back into the database, and then get some more data and do some work, that's a lot of impurity. You don't want to write functional style code in that case. Another, if the problem has to deal with exceptions, exception handling, let me put this in a, in a different way. I'm gonna emphasize exception handling and functional programming are mutually exclusive. I want to, I cannot emphasize that enough. Exception handling is an imperative style of programming idea. You don't want to mix them together. People keep trying, but the code's complexity increases, the chance of error increases as well. And the code is not easy to maintain anymore. You lose the benefits of functional programming. So this is where you gotta wage this and ask the question, do I really wanna do it? So again, going back to what I started with, I am not going to be a radical and say, this is the only way to do it. 
it's important to know the strengths of the tools. There are times when a tool can take us to a great degree. It's kind of asking the question, when should I use my car? You know what? I use my car to go to the stores. When I buy a lot of things, it's easy to bring them back. But I want to go to my neighbor's house. I just walk over. I want to go to my neighborhood park. I take my bicycle. So you need to ask the question, think of these as vehicles. When does it make sense to use a vehicle? Within this range, it makes sense. Outside of that, maybe you should consider something else. So the question is, how do we really program in functional style? And I'll talk about a couple of things that can help us. And I'll mention three things specifically that can help us. Number one, think declaratively first. That's the very first thing to do is to think declaratively. Don't try to jump in and talk about functional yet. Focus on declarative nature first. How do I think of a problem as a, you know, declarative telling what to do? Second, think, uh, think uh, about a series of transformations rather than, uh, you know, steps, uh, st step by step, uh, you know, operation. So think of it as a series of transformation than a step by step operation. And I'll come back and give you an example of that in a few minutes. And then the third is, uh, you know, write a system. So design, uh, you know, uh, design your system as a thin a, 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 a system, let's say, like a ring or a, a frisbee. Uh, so think of a frisbee or a ring. So what does that mean? A circle of purity with a thin uh, ring, uh, uh, you know, of impurity. So invert it. Think of a ring or a, or a frisbee. And if you think of a ring or a frisbee, build a core with purity. Everything is a pure operation. You send me an input, I do the computation, give you an output. On the outside, on the ring, this inverts the way we think about a system, right? Because in most of the systems we develop, what do we do? The database is in the middle. And then you put your logic around it. Invert this, put your logic in the middle. This says, you send me an input, I'll do the computation, give you an output, I can parallelize it, I can reason it, I can build it, and take that pipeline Put the impurity on the peripheral. You take your data, push it through the purity, get the result on the other side, and now go back and commit it. So essentially, think of this as you have impurity, you take the data and you pass it through functional pipeline. You take the output and take the result and then outside of that, perform the impurity. So in other words, you can build the core. This ties back into this, and I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about it. I'll give you one little problem if you want to work with, and take the example of Wordle, the famous game that everybody seems to be playing these days. If you look at Wordle, you have a target word you need to guess, and when you give a guess word, you need to color code it using green or gray or yellow based on whether the letters in the guess appear in the word. If you think about it, let's take an example of one little example. Take river and take the word favor, if you will. If you take favor and river, in this case, what should the result be? Well, notice the R appears in the correct position right there. So the result is yellow, pardon me, gray, because R doesn't exist, gray because I doesn't exist, green, okay, this is not a good symbol. So I would simply say a dash because it doesn't exist. This is gonna be 
exact position because V is in the right position. E doesn't exist. And what about R? R is, as R is in the exact position as well. So this R is not a match because this R in the end matches with this R in the end. So how do you evaluate this? Well, the challenge here is when you evaluate this R, you should say, oh, oh, I shouldn't put anything for this R because this R is not matching with the first R, but the last one. You can write the code in imperative style and it would look like a monster when you do with the you know, for loops and mutation and changing. Go ahead and try that. Write test, by the way, and then write the code in imperative style. Then take a stab at writing in functional style. And now you need to think about the algorithm as a series of transformations and see how you can conceptualize the problem with no explicit mutability. And how do you think of this as a transformational problem? And the answer to that question would be to say, I'm going to count the positions where there's an exact match. I'm going to count the positions where there's not an exact match and do a little bit of a math after that and arrive at the solution. If you're really, really curious about it, I challenge you to write some test, write the code in imperative style, write the code in functional style. And if you have it working, kudos, that's great. If you're stuck with it, you know where to reach me, drop me an email. I'll be glad to set up a time and talk about how we could, you know, think of that in terms of transforming that day, you know, code into a problem of transformations. This comes from practice, right? It's not like you can sit down and look at a filter and map and reduce and next morning, you can write that in that way. Remember I said it's a paradigm shift. Paradigm shifts take a lot of practice to get better at it. And, and that's what it takes to rethink about the problem, to recalibrate our minds and say, how do we think about this problem declaratively? Think about it as a series of transformation rather than step-by-step -step operation. Like in this example, imperatively, we can do this within a matter of 15, 20 minutes. You sit there and say, oh, if it is there, you know, remove it from the target because you considered it already, right? Two simple for loops. Go through it first, do a perfect match, remove it. Then go through one more time, and if it is there, yay, you got it. And remove it if you find it. How do you write that in functional style? You want to think about it as a series of transformation and think about this as a flow where you go from one step to the next step to the next step and get the results. That's why it's a paradigm shift when you take the time. So think about it as a series of impure operations on the outside with the pure set of operations that make up your core and you do the impure operation, read from the database, get it data from a remote service, pass it through your pipeline, get the data on the other side and do your impure operations. Keep your functional pipeline pure. Don't perform any shared mutability. Why? Because correctness depends on it. Functional programming uses laziness for efficiency. It's not going to come and ask you, hey, can I please do this? That's the nature of functional programming, right? Keep that in mind. So FP relies on lazy evaluation for efficiency. It's not asking you, can I do this, please? But lazy evaluation relies on, uh, you know, a lack of shared mutability, which is immutability for correctness. So this is why you need to be careful how you build your middle part, the functional pipeline. Hope that was useful. I'll be delighted to answer any questions or any thoughts that you may have. Uh, Swapnil says, as Java now supports functional style, when should we choose pure functional languages like Clojure? There are a, a number of reasons you might do so. Uh, a lot of times you might use a language like Clojure because you really want a great amount of conciseness and fluency in your code. That could be a reason. You could also say, 
hey, my application is using things like Datomic, which is a database written in Clojure, I might as well use it. So a lot of times it really comes down to the ecosystem. It could be a team that's using Clojure already, could be a database that you're using, a library you're using, or you really want to create a conciseness. Another reason could be where you want to create DSLs, domain-specific languages. Java is not a suitable language for DSLs, but languages like Kotlin are better suited. Languages like Groovy and Ruby are better suited. So you're going, so I, I, I usually say there were N reasons why you may choose other languages. Now there is N minus one reason, right? All the other reasons you may have considered before still exist. You don't choose a language only for functional programming for a lot of different reasons. Those reasons could still exist. Uh, Keith says, could you say more about FP not using exceptions? No, it's not about XP not, uh, FP not using exception. Exceptions are an imperative style of programming idea. So what do you do in exceptions? You are calling a function which calls a function which calls a function which literally blows up. In functional programming, we are dealing with the functional pipeline. So you have a stage one, if you will, and you have followed that you have a stage two, and you have so on, and you have these stages. Now, in this particular case, if you have an exception in a stage, where do you go to? You cannot blow up your stack. In other words, you got to keep going down the pipeline. So in functional programming, you're, you're going in one direction. You are traveling through this pipeline. So if an exception happens here, you don't have the luxury of blowing up the pipeline. So how do you deal with this? You have to then capture the exception as a data, and you have to pass that down through this pipeline. And the minute you start putting the data and error as a data and pass it down, what's going to happen? Every step of your pipeline now fails cohesion, fails single responsibility principle. Now you are going to be dealing with data and error, data and error, and your code becomes more complicated. So the problem is deal with, with error, uh, error as data and pass it down uh, the pipeline. So that's the only option you have to deal with exception in functional programming. But that makes each stage uh, in the pipeline, uh, unfortunately, right, uh, more complex and less cohesive and, and as a result uh, cohesive and what do you lack lacks srp single responsibility principle that's the reason why this is not a charming solution uh, daniel says any recommendation for libraries to provide functional type such as either terrible idea that's why right that's what i was saying because the problem is that you are yeah exactly the railway oriented programming is terrible uh, as well because it complicates your code so much and, and you are going to end up with a lot more complex code and you lose the charm of functional programming. This is why, Daniel, that JavaScript went away from using promises, which is what the railway-oriented programming is. And they started using async and await because async and await brings imperative style to deal with exceptions. And this is why in Project Loom in Java, we're going to be doing uh, exception handling a lot more in the imperative style. So you lose the benefits of functional programming. These are putting lipstick on the peg. That's what you do over and over and over when you do that. So, uh, so uh, uh, Waver is a Java FP library. Yeah, but so what? Uh, the, the question is you want to stick to the you know, core and, and see what those provide. So where does function reactive programming fit into XP? Really important question to consider. And I'm going to summarize that question in a few words. I'm going to say reactive programming. Uh, so reactive programming is a functional programming, I would say, plus plus. So in other words, in reactive programming, you are building on the abstractions from the functional programming both uh, are lazy. So that's a very fundamental thing. Uh, both uh, use 
uh, functional uh, pipeline. They both are dealing with that as well. They both deal with functional pipeline as well. Having said that, reactive programming often deals with a lot more. So reactive programming can deal with asynchronous versus synchronous, whereas functional programming doesn't deal with asynchrony at that point. And also, you have three channels uh, in the case of reactive programming for data, uh, error channel, if you will, and also a complete a signal a channel. Functional programming doesn't quite distinguish those things for you. Reactive programming has a much better handle on error handling, just a little bit. Not a perfect solution still, but I would say that's what comes the closest to dealing with errors better. Not functional programming, not the railway uh, you know, pattern, but really the uh, reactive programming comes closer, not perfect still, but, but they are very closely related because concept built on that abstraction. Um, so what did you suggest for solving parallel screen problem when they tried to add the list for in for each? Oh yeah, John, very important. So the answer to that question is to say collect a to list as an answer or a dot to list if you think about how to call that a dot to list because the collect and the to list functions have been implemented to provide threat safety. So, so the answer to that question is, you know, never do the following, right? So never do the following. If you are dealing with the collection, like in the, in the problem that we saw, what you want to do is, you know, don't, uh, don't do the following. Uh, so don't do dot for each, like for example, and then say name, and then taking the name and saying, you know, result dot add name, terrible, don't do this. Instead, what you do is, uh, you know, instead you do a collect uh, a to list like so, uh, or just a to list in Java 19, I'm sorry, Java 16 or later. So because these have been implemented exactly for providing uh, threat safety, that, that's the purpose of those in general. Um, so many shares with Java incre increasingly adopting uh, FP constructs, does it mean transitioning OOP design patterns would lose their popularity? No, not really. Your design patterns really are implementation mechanisms for common problems. Now, as you and I know, every problem has multiple solutions. So the patterns will change and evolve and certain patterns will still be relevant. Certain patterns may change uh, certain patterns may become irrelevant. So it's not going to be a, a, a large generalization to say this is of no use anymore. It's incrementally going to uh, evolve uh, based on what you're trying to do. Um, and Rohit says, uh, here I'm losing purity and immutability to achieve readability. Don't, don't, don't do that. Because the minute you trade that, this is like saying, I'm going to uh, lose ethics I'm going to lose a morality so I can become rich quickly. That doesn't really last too long. Think of sustainability. Think of how is the code maintainable in the long run. And, and guess what? You did not even achieve readability. That's the problem, right? So this is what you need to keep in mind. So I will mention this in this, those who compromise a quality to gain uh, performance or readability, right? Uh, perceived readability. Uh, readability, in your case, uh, what is going to happen in this case? Uh, will, you know, get neither. That's the problem. Your code is not readable. You think it is readable. And now you got a bigger problem. It is hard to understand, hard to read, hard to maintain, and it is misbehaving. So, the easiest way to fail is to take the shortcut. So, and don't confuse verbosity to number of lines of code. That's the key, right? So there are two different concepts we need to keep in mind. There is verbosity, there is conciseness, there is terse. Don't confuse terse with concise. This is a very, very common misconception. 
You take something that's cryptic and terse and say, look at this, isn't that beautiful, it's concise. No, it's worse than verbose code. So you want to make the code concise, not terse. So don't confuse the number of lines of code to mean verbosity. That's not what verbosity is. Verbosity is where you have too many moving parts. You're doing unnecessary operations. And sometimes your functional code may be a few more lines of code than functional style code, but it's still concise because it's easier to understand, easier to follow. So focus on uh, doing the, following the first principles first, meaning avoid shared mutability. Make, so the key things to keep in mind, right? So make the code uh, correct first, then, right, then all else. If you tell me the code may not work properly, it may have problems, but look how beautiful this is. It doesn't matter. And, and also, one of the slogans I try to follow is this, make it work, make it better real soon. So don't try to, you know, outsmart yourself. Don't try to make this, oh, look how fantastic this code can be. No, make it work first. And if you say, look, I can write this code imperatively and I can guarantee it's correct, that's great. Start with that first then go off to really make things better after that one step at a time and that's what you want to focus on and uh Arthur says we shouldn't do for each name result with parallel because some thread may not be able to insert the name in the result list no it's not because it may not be able to insert it it's because you may have race conditions so you may have multiple threads colliding on each other and when they collide on each other, one may overwrite the data the other writes, and you're going to have incorrect results. So it's not about the ability of a thread to access the collection. It is where they end up colliding with each other. That's the race condition you're going to run into. And the worst problem about this is you may be running the program for a long time, and you may never get to see, get to see a problem until one day it misbehaves, and it's very hard to repeat it as well. Uh, Jyoti says, I'm using functional programming using uh, Scala on my project, but sometimes it becomes very complex to understand. I know that a good maintenance code should be simpler. Is that true for everyone who uses Scala or is it due to my initial level of uh, on this paradigm? Uh, it's hard for me to answer that question because you can write bad code in anything you want to. So if somebody tells me, you cannot write bad code in functional programming. I will challenge you and show you how you can write terrible code in functional programming. I have a good friend, Glenn Vanderberg. He says bad programmers will move heaven and earth to write bad code. So, and, and when I wrote the book on Scala, one of the statements I made in the book is Scala is like a city. There are parts where you can hang out safely, and there are parts you want to stay away from or get mugged and get beaten up if you go to those parts. So I don't know the answer to your question, Jyoti. It could be because you're unfamiliar, or it could be because you wandered into a bad neighborhood in your Scala code, and they shouldn't have written that code. This is quite normal among people who complain about such things because sometimes people go overboard and use things that are not necessary or use them in a way that it's not obvious. This is one of the reasons why things like code review, pair programming, all those things are still important no matter what paradigm we program in, because I've, I've written bad functional style code as much as better functional style code, but when somebody reviews the code and, and sits down and pairs, we can say, yeah, let's do this because it's a good approach. Let's not do that because that's a terrible approach. So it could be that, you know, I, I, I wish I could tell you it's because of your unfamiliarity. It may be, I don't know, or it could be that the code was itself written really poorly and uh, they should have really written a better way. Or it could be a combination of the two, right? We don't know the, the answer for that. Thank, thank you, Kayla. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> That's a long time, 24 years. Wow. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so how do we increase our functional thinking? Be beautiful question, Rohit. Um, my recommendation is uh, pair extensively with other people. This is one of the best ways, in my opinion, we can really get better at what we do. Um, you know, as, as uh, I always leverage the words of Newton, Newton said, I see the farthest because I sit on the shoulders of giants, he said. That's one of the greatest way, in my opinion, you know, if, if and, and this is one of the reasons I mentioned earlier is if you decide to try the Wordle example, you you can have my email address. You can pair with me. That's that's why I kind of hinted that, right? So if you try that example and you want to really explore it, drop an email, we'll set up some time and pair. That's a great way, I, and I pair relentlessly. The reason is every time I pair, I learn something better. I learn something different. It changes my line of thinking. And, and that's why I pair extensively. Go find a colleague who, who has, you know, as passionate, as much passion as you do, and, and tell them, hey, do you want to spend uh, two hours on a Saturday afternoon pairing and working on this? This could be somebody out in the community, right? Doesn't have to be somebody at work. Or somebody at work, you tell them, hey, I'm writing this code in, pair, uh, in, in, in functional style. Would you mind uh, pairing with me for 30 minutes? Let's take a look at how we can do this together. This is a great way to learn from each other. So, so don't hesitate at all uh, to, to consider that, right? So that's a, one of the best ways to learn is to practice, 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 and have that feedback from others is a great way to, to do so. Thank you, appreciate it, thank you. All right, I think we can wrap up, Janvi. Thank you so much again for having me. I really appreciate that. Uh, yes. Uh, I think someone unmuted themselves. Is, is it a question or is it was by mistake? I'm sorry, which one is this? I think someone mistakenly unmuted themselves. So uh, I think there are no more questions and thank you so much Venkat for doing this webinar. It really means a lot. And uh, this uh, webinar, the session was really amazing. Got to learn a lot of new things. And uh, uh, thanks to the audience as well for amazing questions and making this uh, uh, session very interactive and we had a lot of discussions. So thanks a lot for everyone joining in. Thanks again, Venkat, for taking out time of your schedule and joining us here. And looking forward to a lot more webinars like this with a lot of great audience and speakers like Venkat. So thank you so much, everyone. I think uh, we can take a screenshot if that is fine. Uh, it would be great if, uh, if uh, people can turn on the videos if possible for them. Yeah. All right, I think we are good then. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Venkat. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.
All right. Well, thank you again so much, uh, Janvi, for having me and uh, have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a nice day to you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for all the effort and all the uh, you know wonderful organizations for the entire team. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.